When discussing climate change, it's important to focus on the hard data and not just be tempted to laugh at the insane behavior of climate change activists. So I'm going to discuss hard data. But not before I laugh at the insane behavior of climate change activists. I mean, there's just so much material. Because when you're trying to communicate the serious, sober, dire straits message that the Earth is in peril, what better way to do so than this? <laughs> Well, I was a bit sceptical before, but that's me convinced. No, wait. Now I'm convinced. If only we could figure out a technological way to harness the power of crazy to replace fossil fuels. Because Jesus Christ, it's in plentiful supply. There's this guy. Wait on you! Ah! Wait on you! Another fountain of rational credibility. But get this, they arrested him when he was about to save the Amazon. He's here to save the Amazon! Amazon's fucked now, press F to pay respects. Ah! Then there's this guy. I'm just a father of two children that's very frightened of their future. Imagine turning on the TV and seeing your dad crying because of the weather. Psychologists are warning about a new trend of eco-anxiety amongst children. They're literally terrifying kids into believing that their parents and all their friends are going to be dead in 12 years. A hundred years ago, weather-related disasters killed half a million people a year. Today, it's 20,000 a year. A reduction of 95%, it does not lead to a death of billions. I mean, aren't you scaring people with this rhetoric, aren't you? Alarmist language works. Then there's this. <laughs> the fuck is that? Go clean up a beach or something. This isn't a protest. This isn't taking action. It's a social occasion. It's Burning Man on Thames. <laughs> It's a bunch of sanctimonious, privileged, posh twats lecturing working class people on why their living standards should be reduced even further. Hundreds of middle class vegans occupying Smithfield Meat Market preventing ordinary working people from doing their jobs. Then going to McDonald's for their lunch. Why are they coming to demonstrate against us, possibly putting us out of work, asked one worker, because of this happy clappy mob. I'm not going to be able to pay my bills. Bravo, guys, bravo. Elitist smog snobs putting working class people out of work, out of business. So liberal. So progressive. When you start to resemble the aristocrats from the Hunger Games, you've probably stopped representing the interests of working class people. May the odds be ever in your favor. There are literally mass riots in major Western countries like Holland and France because working and lower middle class people are having their livelihoods destroyed by climate taxes. In France, the Yellow Vest movement began partially as a revolt against fuel tax hikes. In Holland, the Boron protest began as a revolt against environmental regulations on livestock. Both of which you lot support as you jet off to your daddy's ski lodge in Stard while pontificating about how much you care about the little people. The best thing you could do is to change your own bloody lives and stop telling the rest of us how to change ours and demanding change immediately. You're a bunch of self-entitled wastrels. Get back to whatever work it is you're supposed to be doing and stop being a pain in the ass. Then there's the giant waste of taxpayer money and resources. Knife crime in London is at a record high. People are being stabbed to death every day. Oh, but I'm sorry, we need nine police officers to escort this giant pink octopus out of the area. Then there's the sheer unbridled rank hypocrisy. And listen, I know everyone's a hypocrite to some extent. I know none of us can lead the perfect life in line with all our beliefs. But Jesus Christ, there's more hypocrisy on display when it comes to climate change activists than if Matt Lauer turned up at a women's rights march. A diesel generator. Seriously, those wooden panels aren't really muffling the noise, are they? Surely you didn't use them to try to hide the diesel generator pumping out God knows how many pollutants. Surely not. Take these three clowns, all of them wearing Extinction Rebellion badges to support the cause. Stephen Fry, 
Do you think his eco-awareness began before or after he took a big fat check to front an ad for Heathrow Airport? Now that you've landed at Heathrow, let me be the first to welcome you to this happy island we call home. The UK's biggest, most polluting airport. The airport these Extinction Rebellion activists are always trying to shut down. So eco-friendly. Then these two idiots, Olivia Coleman and Azim Chowdhury. Both were paid by British Airways, the UK's biggest and most polluting airline, to appear in an ad that is played before every single BA flight. After the success of last year's in-flight safety video, lots more actors have been in touch with me being like, Chibadi, please let us be part of the sequel. Thank you, darling. Cappuccino, you have four sugars? Actually, I've come to read for the audition. So all three virtue signal about reducing CO2 emissions, having literally taken money from the biggest airport and biggest airline in the country. So eco-friendly. Here's another thought. Maybe when you try to block bridges in the name of stopping petroleum-powered vehicles, don't do it while proudly displaying a bunch of PVC yoga mats made out of petroleum. Kinda looks a bit awkward. These morons are so far up their own backsides, they've prescribed themselves the power to decide who gets hospital treatment. They already stopped a man reaching his dying father's bedside, but they assure us they'll have conversations with ambulance crew about letting some people through. Possibly. Now there's a major hospital, isn't there, on Westminster Bridge. Are you worried about how it could impact patients or families trying to visit, you know, their loved ones? Well, I think it's about this understanding of the wider perspective. Um, we have people on the bridges who can have conversations with people who are trying to get there, and there's potential of, you know, if people really, really need to get there, about letting them through, possibly, in that conversation, possibly. Oh, I'm sorry, your son's bleeding profusely to death. Let's just check with Sebastian here to see if he's finished his Kundalini. Possibly. Extinction Rebellion. As you shut down main roads leading to London hospitals, I walked 20 minutes with someone who has cancer, so they could get to hospital for a procedure as the car couldn't get through. 20 minutes might not sound long, but when you have cancer, it is. Thanks, Extinction Rebellion. As ever with these clowns, it's very much do as I say, not as I do. When it comes to their lifestyles, it's not about reducing carbon footprints on an individual level. Do you have a TV at home? I don't think that's relevant. Do your kids to, use iPads and computers? The, the, yes or no? Relevant to the, Can you answer these questions? It's not relevant. It's really not about our individual carbon footprint. But when it comes to what you're allowed to do, it's a completely different story. So when Prince Harry said everyone's carbon footprint counts, every footprint counts... It, it does. He's wrong. It does. Oh, it does? It, it does. He said it doesn't. It's really not about our individual carbon footprint. Every footprint counts. It, it does. It's really not about our individual carbon footprint. And what about Extinction Rebellion as a group itself? Self. It was founded by this guy. Listen to how reasonable he sounds. We are going to force the governments to act, and if we don't, if they don't, we'll bring them down and create a democracy fit for purpose. And yes, some may die in the process. Excuse me? We'll bring them down and some may die in the process. See, I wasn't around in the 60s, but I thought hippies were all about peace, love and empathy. At what point did Extinction Rebellion go full Manson family cult? Some may die in the process. Listen to what Extinction Rebellion co-founder Stuart Basden says about the group. In his own words, Extinction Rebellion isn't about the climate. What's it about? Dismantling European civilization, ending the patriarchy, and demolishing the belief that heterosexuality is normal. Yeah, these are his words. This from a guy whose white guilt is so pervasive he's harassing his own family to send reparations to black families in America that share his surname. Yeah. Really. So according to the two founding members of Extinction Rebellion, it's about overthrowing governments during which process some people might die. Some may die. And overthrowing the entire system of Western civilization. Right down to the biological reality of heterosexuality as the normal default human breeding proclivity. And there you were thinking it was about recycling your jam jars, who funds Extinction Rebellion. Despite claiming how completely transparent they are about this, some of the names of those who donate large amounts are kept secret. Oh, and they've raised nearly a million quid in just a few days. Still, someone's got to pay for all that MDMA. <laughs> Extinction Rebellion's poster child is Greta Thunberg. Greta? 
Greta is our Lord and Saviour. She's the new Jesus Christ. She can do no wrong. Let the church bells ring. Got a few questions about her friends, though. Arnold Schwarzenegger. The dude who literally has a garage full of muscle cars and tanks. So eco-friendly. Prince Harry. The dude who took four private jet trips in 11 days to save the planet. No, to party at Elton John's mansion. So eco-friendly. Leonardo DiCaprio. The dude who took a private jet to pick up an environmental award. The dude who hangs out on 470-foot luxury yachts owned by billionaire Middle Eastern oil shakes before going on people's climate marches. So eco-friendly. Absolutely fucking not. The most vehement opposition to Extinction Rebellion is from people aged 65 plus. Oh, who cares what they think? This is about... Future generations. This is about the climate kids. Really? Let's have a look at what the boomers have to say. Climate kids, when placing blame and pointing fingers, remember this. It was our generation that introduced recycling to keep up with the demand of consumption from your generation. When we were kids, the only fast food was at the local chippy and it came wrapped in newspaper, not in a polystyrene case. Our energy drink was Lucasade and it came in a glass bottle that we used to take back to the shop to recycle. We walked or biked to school or work and didn't ask mum or dad to drive us because it was raining and we didn't want to get wet for the 1,000 yards to the school gate. We had hand-me-down clothes and used a payphone if we needed to make a call. We remember power cuts on a regular basis and played board games or read by candlelight. Our homes had single glazed windows that would ice up in winter and we shared our bedrooms that were so cold you could see your breath with our brothers or sisters. We didn't have central heating. Have you ever had to use someone else's bath water after they had finished? We have. We didn't have TVs in our bedrooms left on standby 24 hours a day or mobile devices that have to be charged if the battery drops below 80%. Our holidays were in the UK in tents and not in Ibiza and we didn't get there by plane. It is you that is the mass consumed that demand the latest phones, fashion, sunny holidays, fast food and transportation. So point the finger of blame at yourselves, you self-indulgent, deluded, needy, greedy, ignorant, unapologetic, rude, selfish generation. Feel that boomer resentment. Then there's the claim that all this is academic because we're in a climate emergency. This is an emergency. Bullshit. It's all bullshit. There are real environmental issues. Global warming isn't one of them. The hockey stick chart used as the foundation for the IPCC's report grossly exaggerated temperature increases. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has been repeatedly caught altering previous temperature data to make warming look more pronounced. During the climate gate scandal, it was revealed that scientists deliberately altered data to quote, hide the decline in temperatures. Over 50 years ago, climate change activist Paul Ehrlich warned in his book, The Population Bomb, quote, in the 1970s and 1980s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death in spite of any crash programs embarked upon now. Sound familiar? I am not sure that I'm going to be able to feed my children <laughs> in years to come. In the 1970s, we were bombarded with waves of hysteria about a coming climate crisis. What was causing the crisis? Global cooling. Newsweek, April 28th, 1975. The cooling world. Unless we did something drastic, falling temperatures were going to cause mass starvation. Again, sound familiar? I am not sure that I'm going to be able to feed my children <laughs> in years to come. And you know why back then they were all fear-mongering about global cooling? Because after World War II, temperatures across the planet substantially dropped. Even as CO2 emissions substantially increased. Wait, it's almost as if there's no actual connection between the two and that the sun is the real driver of climate, given that sun activity is far more closely aligned with temperature fluctuations. Surely not. It's almost as if there have been far warmer periods in the history of the planet, which actually resulted in a thriving ecosystem. Surely not. It's almost as if ice core samples prove temperature leads CO2 increases and not the other way around. Surely not. The new study to be presented by U.S. Navy researchers later this week warns it could happen in as little as seven years. Seven years from now. On this one, he predicted, as, as you heard there, that uh, the Arctic ice cap would have vanished by now, really. But satellite images, oh dear, they show that it's, it's got thicker. Oh, but the science is settled. 
Really? I guess that's why you literally have to force university students to attend mandatory classes on climate change. But it's not indoctrination, honest climate activist. The science is settled. Me. Cool, that means we can defund your research since it's settled. Climate activist. Defund the... What? It's almost as if all the investment firms, NGOs and billionaire elitists fear-mongering about climate change are the same people who stand to make gargantuan, jaw-dropping profits off of climate change because they own and are all invested in the carbon trading mechanisms that deal with carbon offsets. The combination of global warming and growing environmental consciousness is creating a potentially huge market in the trading of pollution emission credits. BlackRock Capital with the Climate Finance Partnership, HSBC, JP Morgan Chase and Citi, all part of the Blended Finance Action Task Force, and they state there are, quote, profits to be had in, quote, climate-related sectors. Rothschild Australia and E3 International launching the Carbon Ring Consortium. 23 multinational corporations at the G8 Climate Change Roundtable, including Ford, Toyota, British Airways, BP and Unilever, who all called for these carbon trading systems to be established right at the beginning. Rothschild, HSBC, JP Morgan Chase, BP, Ford, Wow, it just sounds so grassroots, doesn't it? The only impact Extinction Rebellion is having on the environment is to make people who care about the environment look absolutely stupid. Even if you think global warming is a real issue, their solutions are just utterly ludicrous. To reach your target, you'd have to stop all flying. Aviation would come to an end. Possibly. I mean... By 2025. They could be directing thousands of people to clean up beaches, to plant trees, you know, Real environmentalism. What are they doing instead? Antagonizing ordinary people, depriving the working class of employment, and clowning around like it's the last day of Woodstock. There are real environmental issues, but global warming isn't one of them. Man-made climate change is a monumental top-down fraud. It's a ploy to prevent the third world from developing, to keep it mired in poverty. It's a huge tax scam. To redistribute wealth from the poor and the middle class to the 1%. And these self-satisfied, sanctimonious, useful idiots, whether they know it or not, are fully complicit. <laughs>